Mom? I'm writing you an email instead of calling because I'm afraid of speaking about this in my own house. I don't know exactly what is happening, but maybe you will. Maybe you know someone who can help. Before you get in the car or make any snap decisions about coming over here, please read all of this email first. John hasn't been acting at all like himself. And I'm responsible for everything that caused this. Please don't tell Grandma. Uh, she'll freak out and that could make things worse. For now, please just keep this between you and me. Let me explain. You know, John's been a fan of paranormal reality shows for as long as we've known him. Well, we were about to celebrate our fifth anniversary, and I wanted to do something special for him. A real paranormal team from the Montgomery area. They advertised a guided investigation for beginners, and I thought I'd surprise him with tickets to one of their ghost hunts. And I did surprise him. He had no idea until the very last minute, even with the new flashlights and walkie-talkies I bought to go with us. The cherry on top was the reservation I made for a pre-investigation meal at his favorite sushi place downtown. Now, I know what you're going to say, Mom. Believe me, as much as we love the paranormal, we share your feelings about respecting the dead. Please keep this in mind as I continue. It's been about a week since we drove out to a small town suburb of Montgomery for this event. John and I showed up at the town's community center around 10 p.m., and the paranormal investigation crew met us in the auditorium. About a dozen people were expected to turn out including us. However, our hope for a more one-on-one -on -one experience plummeted as the crowd of ghost-hunting hopefuls grew much larger than anticipated. We shared a look of silent annoyance as we observed most of the folks who stood around us. There were about as many ghost-adventurer wannabes milling about as you might guess. We thought about leaving when it was clear most of them wouldn't approach the activity with much, if any, sincerity, and we weren't interested in ghost-hunting with a big rowdy group. I tried to not let it show, but John could see I was agitated. My plan was falling apart, and my disappointment could have clouded the whole night. But John didn't let me sink too far. He's so good at making lemonade like that. He put his arm around me, and I could I can remember the sardonic look in his clover green eyes when he said, Buck up, buttercup. The way I see it, we can either stay and get away from the hillbillies, make our own little investigation group, just us and the ghosts, or... We can go home and watch Patrick Swayze be a studly ghost while we play with the Ouija board and sip spiked hot cocoa. I wish we'd gone home, but the pep talk was enough to bring me back around. One of the investigators emerged from the panel to greet the large group. She stood out like a ripe strawberry, hard to miss her billowy bright red blouse. Big gold buttons polka dotted her sleeves and ample upper body like flashy fruit seeds. The woman was as loud as she was bodacious, with a voice that could startle a sailor. Her name was Pam, and she claimed she could bring out the dead with her mediumistic abilities. It wasn't that I didn't believe her, but she seemed less likely to draw lingering specters in for a conversation than she was to drive away everything in a 30-mile radius. When Pam was in the lead... The paranormal team gave us an introduction of their experiences, followed by a tutorial on how to properly collect evidence with devices like electromagnetic field readers, dowsing rods, and digital voice recorders, all of which could be found at each of the locations they'd picked for the night to help lead the investigations. Then Pam gave us some background information about the various locations they'd chosen around this small town, and we were to choose one of them to investigate. The paranormal team would split up to assist with the group's gathering at each location. Almost everyone signed up to attend the abandoned Baptist church and the haunted fire station. But our dumbasses chose the Confederate cemetery. It seemed like the right choice at the time. We were only two of four people signing up to investigate it. It was as close to a one-on-one -on -one as we could get. As John and I were about to leave and look up directions to the cemetery, Pam shouldered her way towards us, declaring we'd be a group together with her. The sound of her raucous voice effectively dampened any newfound hope we'd managed to find for a quiet adventure. Pan invited a pair of meek-looking ladies to join our small group, a plain woman named Kate, and Kate's equally plain, grown daughter, Samantha. Kate and Samantha were nice enough, though quiet. John guessed they disapproved of us once they saw us holding hands. 
We introduced ourselves as devoted husbands and smiled a little, and they flinched. You would have been so proud of us, Mom. Our group of five split up into our respective vehicles and followed directions to the cemetery independently. It was situated on the outskirts of a housing area built within the past 20 years. We drove through town and into the wooded hills to get there, arriving around midnight. In these hills, the only surrounding light traveled from dim and distant porches, scattered amongst layers of old pines and oak trees. The poorly lit corners of rooftops and shutters peeked between black leaves and branches, standing guard like a bunch of retirees with nothing better to do than spy on the neighbors. We parked outside the cemetery in a little grove along the fence posts out front, headlights off, as instructed. Unlike the traditional gothic iron used to encompass the other burial grounds, this was a sturdy livestock fence. The broad white planks glowed like electric coils in the night. John cracked a joke about the ghosts of the Confederacy being racist, even in death, requiring a gravestone, requiring a gravesite fence so white it didn't even need a whites only sign. There wasn't an actual sign like that, but there might as well have been. Memorial Day had just passed a few weeks prior, and there were plenty of little Confederate flags stuck in the ground at the base of the headstones. As we strolled up to meet the others at the gate, Pam turned to lead the way, a ribbon of cigarette smoke trailing behind her as she walked. Our shoes crunched layers of dried leaves and twigs as our eyes adjusted to the static darkness. Despite the grip summer weather already had on Alabama, a chill had settled over the cemetery. I was glad we'd worn our sweatshirts as we made our way over to the center of a cluster of well-ordered rows of graves, careful to avoid tripping over the shadowed stones jutting from the ground. I handed John one of the new flashlights and reminded him to turn on the digital recorder, since the paranormal team members had indicated it would be central to the investigations. The five of us took a seat on the stone bench in the middle of the cemetery, flanked on all sides by decrepit 200-year-old headstones. Pam led us in a twang prayer before we started. John giggled at Pam's heavy southern accent and how she pronounced the word Amen as Amen. We were tasked with getting evidence from paranormal activity via EVP, or electronic voice phenomena, on the digital recorders, and photos with our phones. We waited several seconds between questions so the recorder could pick up responses, even if we couldn't hear them in the moment. I don't know quite how to describe the seance, save for how somber it felt to ask personal questions of the corpses beneath our feet. Separated from us only by some 250-odd years of layered pine needles, dirt, and the thin wooden boxes cradling them. We asked everything we could think of in the span of about three of Pam's cigarettes, taking care to be respectful in our tone and line of questions. It went as peacefully as I had hoped it would, save for the muggy, stagnant clouds of Pam's cigarettes. Another cigarette later, and we were just about ready to say a closing prayer before leaving when a deep growl rumbled from somewhere behind Kate and Samantha. It was low and menacing, like nothing I'd ever heard before. Everyone went silent. That's how I knew all of us had heard it. I stood up and pointed the flashlight in the direction of the sound, careful to avoid blinding whatever animal might have had its hackles up. But Mom... Nothing was there. Hand on your Bible. We put down our recorders and got up to point every light we had in search of whatever had made that threatening sound. I don't know why. I, I didn't have my hunting rifle in the car at the time, so I didn't even know what I would have done if we discovered whatever had made that sound. Maybe it was the, the just allure of, of experiencing something on our haunted seance trip, even if it wasn't ghosts. Whatever the reason, we all spent several minutes combing between the broken tombstones. Except for Pam. We walked in pairs, everyone taking a hundred pictures of the cemetery like, like good paranormal investigators so we could get out there as soon as possible. I admit, as much as I was inclined to believe it was an animal, and not something paranormal, in that moment I really wanted it to be something supernatural. John never left my side while I snapped pictures in the dark. In the distance, the concurrent flicker of Kate and Samantha's phone cameras in the far corner of the cemetery distracted me from my own picture-taking, and I stumbled over a particularly small headstone. As I leaned down to read the markings on the stone, I felt a powerful gust rip past me, nearly knocking me over. It came from my left and picked up speed as it passed through me, bulldozing John to the ground. He didn't get up. 
Steady lay on his back where he fell, gasping like a dying fish. I was stunned. How could anything have barreled through my six-foot-five husband like that without also throwing me for a mile? I took a moment to scan the trees for whatever had hit us before dropping to my knees at John's side. Helping him was priority. I barely registered the women shrieking a moment later, tending to John as I was, but the, the engine of one of the cars roared to life and its headlights lit up the whole cemetery. I had to squint against the onslaught of sudden high beams as they peeled out, leaving us there in the pitch dark. Where was Pam? I didn't have time to worry about her. John still couldn't catch his breath and a, a creeping dread was gnawing at the back of my neck. So unsure of how else to help him, I got behind him and crouched to loop my arms through his, pulling his body back towards the car. I stumbled a few times while pulling him along, but he was finally able to get up as we reached the edge of the cemetery, and together we ran to the car and jumped in. When I flipped on the headlights, they revealed the pitch black shape of an enormous half-man, half-buck, with thick, gnarled antlers twisting skyward, unending against the backdrop of the trees towering over us. It was nothing but shadow, no facial features, no clothing or skin tone, nothing. The figure absorbed every bit of the light that should have revealed it. If it was physical, and if it was just a shadow, it should have disappeared, but it was there, looming over the hood of our car with the most, the most horrifying white eyes. Even, even in the headlights, its eyes were... They were glowing. I screamed. My, my guts loosened when it leaned forward and slammed its hooves on the hood. That wasn't my imagination, Mom. The marks are still there to prove it. I threw the car into gear. I got us I got us the hell out of there. I didn't think twice about Pam at that point. I didn't know if she'd left us there, if, if all three of the women had. But in that moment, I was just... I just wanted to put as much distance between us and that thing as possible. I looked in the rearview mirror to see if it was following us, but there was nothing... There was nothing on the road behind us. John was silent the whole way back to Montgomery. I figured he was just as rattled as I was, so I didn't, I didn't push him to, re to recall the terror that we had just experienced. When we got back to the house, John walked over to the porch steps and then stopped and just stood there. And I, I asked him if he'd gotten hurt when we fell in the cemetery, but he didn't answer. Instead, he just rubbed his lower back and he winced. I, I noticed I'd... I decided I'd call the chiropractor in the morning and request a weekend appointment for him. What I'm about to tell you is why I've given you all this background, because John... John... He hasn't been himself at all since that night. He sits out on the porch all day, all night, no matter the weather, he hasn't slept. Or if he has, it's been with his eyes open. The whites of his... Of his gorgeous brown eyes have turned... Red, the skin of his eyelids is turning purple. He hasn't touched the food I put in front of him. I tried bringing him water, he simply ignores the glass, he glared at me when I came out of the house. He hasn't said a word. He won't come inside for any reason, even for the even for the bathroom. He, sm he smells! I I've, tried to, I've tried to clean him, but that's when I hear the, the vicious growl again, the same one that we heard in the cemetery. It doesn't... No, it, it doesn't really come from him, though. It, it's as if the growl is coming from from around him. He's been like this for a week. Pam came by yesterday. She was quiet, apologetic. She told us the paranormal team apologized for sending us out there without more of a structured team. And I apologized for John for leaving in a hurry. And I tried to explain what happened and showed her the dents and the, 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 the ones that the creature left in the hood of my car. She said she'd fetch the recorders that we left by the benches and, and the one that was hidden in her car after a a gravelly voice said bitch next to her ear. Pam audibly swallowed as she described it. And she told me that she'd seen Kate and Samantha nailing an inverted cross into the tree nearest our car before they peeled down. I opened my phone to search through the pictures from that night. All we found were dozens of shots that were either too dark or too blurry to decipher. I told Pam that I had forwarded the pictures to the paranormal team so they could spend more time analyzing them. Pam mentioned that Kate and Samantha's recordings... They had come back with, with a lot of what sounded like growling, which corroborated our accounts at least. She said the women never came back though. They'd emailed their seance recordings and they never mentioned that they'd left us behind. And I felt some anger in recalling their actions. I don't know. I don't know their side of it, but their, their lack of engagement with us makes me suspicious. And, and with Pam, with what she's shared, I, I fear we may be dealing with something much worse than than the ghosts of some confederate soldier. 
John was sitting on the porch like a stoic maniac when Pam tried to approach him. The growl that erupted was louder than I'd heard from him previously. We both, we both took an instinctive step back and Pam regarded us with bewildered shock. She promised to be in touch, fleeing to her car and pulling out of the driveway quicker than a hummingbird could recite the alphabet. After she left, I went to the toy store and I bought a Ouija board. <sighs> I don't really know what I thought would happen. The desperation convinced me that it wouldn't hurt to try. I mean, maybe, maybe I thought I could communicate with spirits in the, in the cemetery. But they'd have the answers. Call it stupid if you want. You'd do the same for Grandma. You know, if, you know, if you had no other choice. I took every precaution I could think of. I brought out every religious item Grandma had ever gifted me. I set them up on the kitchen table. I said prayers and lit white candles. I prepared to ask my questions as to the other side. But as soon as I touched the planchette, heavy footsteps thundered across the porch. I looked up to see John standing square in front of our sliding glass door, not ten feet away from where I sat. He stood stock still, though I, I, I swear the outline of his body in the porch light shivered from head to toe. The air around him vibrated like intense heat waves floating over a hot August asphalt. His exhausted eyes searched the inside of the house before finally resting on me. Standing there, staring at me like that, I was... I was terrified of him. Me, a, a grown man with a kitchen full of weapons at my disposal, and I was deathly afraid of my own husband. My hands left the planchette, and I, I picked up one of Grandma's wooden crosses. I clutched it tight to my chest. The man that wasn't my John anymore smiled, and that familiar growl reverberated through the thick glass door between us like a, like a purr. And then he turned and he walked back to his spot on the porch like nothing had happened. I put away the spirit board, but kept all the angel figures and religious items out. I tried to sage the house today, but got the same terrifying reaction that the spirit board inspired last night, so I stopped. Last night, after I finally gave up and I went to bed, I heard chanting outside our bedroom window. I got up to see where the hell it was coming from, hoping that uh, I would find my husband as himself again, but when I peeked outside, I found him still in the same spot on the porch, dozens of flies buzzing around his smiling face. I walked to get the mail this morning, putting as much space between John and me to avoid the, the smell and his gaze, and when I noticed knobs at his temples, calcifying to what looked like horns or, or antlers... Pam left behind the digital recorders, and I've listened to everything, everything it captured from that night a hundred times. Each time I listen, the recording feels like it gets longer. You can hear us talking and asking our questions, the clink, clink, clink of Kate and Samantha hammering onto the tree, and then John, John getting knocked down, and Kate and Samantha shriek in the distance, and then there's this, this otherworldly voice before a car peels out in the background. Sounds like it's right up against the mic, whispering, or scratching, or something. And it sounds like a language, like some, like some of it might even be English. So far, the only word I can distinguish is mine. Please, mom. Mom, I, I need your help. But you can't tell anyone. This is gonna have to be a, as private as possible. I don't, I'm afraid if I call you to discuss it, he might overhear the conversation. I don't really know if he can understand me at this point, but he doesn't like it when I try to leave, so I'm emailing you. It's my only option. If you know a priest or a, or a pastor who's trustworthy and you can you can meet them in person and tell them about what's happening, I need I need their guidance as soon as possible. Please download my attached audio file and forward it to the police if something should happen to me. I love you, Mom. Please help me. I'm so scared. I'm, I'm exhausted trying to, to stand guard over myself. I don't know if John will try to come inside, but I'm not sleeping and the chanting doesn't end. Pray for me. And pray for John. Love. Davy. Yes.
Lock your doors. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching today's video. And if you're on the podcast, then thank you for watching today's podcast. And if you're on uh, not the video or the podcast, then thank you for tuning into this telepathic broadcast. Oh, and there's something I need to mention to all of you. It's actually the big Halloween surprise. I mentioned this early on in the summer, but I never really got a chance to say what it was because it wasn't really nailed down at the time. We, and by we, I mean me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew, are going on tour across the United States in October. All the dates for it have been nailed down as of actually today, and tickets should be going on sale as of actually today. If you'd like to find out more, I'm going to have a bunch of information in the description down below all the way up until the tour is finished. But if you want to get a hold of your tickets, all the venues we've chosen have very limited seating, so make sure you get your tickets now if we're heading to a town near you. And one of the most exciting things about this is that I've been able to work with Mew across the United States doing conventions over the past couple of years. But this is the first time I think that Creeps McPasta is coming to the U.S., and it's especially the first time I'm going to be able to work with him live on stage. So this is going to be a show that's bigger than anything I've ever dreamed of being able to do in my entire YouTube career. So check it out down below at marginwalkerpresents.com to get a hold of your tickets and come see us to celebrate Spooktober. Especially, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys over at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta are the best. Especially, Trace Miles, Talon Karlick, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Daniel Polson, Champinsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Rev Miroku, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, Melissa Swaygart, Kudir Max, Jay Kerbine, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Chris Wrights, The Gender Bros, Mads Beck Lorenzen Post, Don Mulmeister, Eliminator86, Nebsky, Andrew Stenberg, Jason Silsma, Steampunk Center, and Rafael Rodriguez. If you guys would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And that's it for tonight. Sweet dreams, everyone.